Mm -hmm. So in the back, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the soundtrack? OK. All right, so today what I'd like to tell you about, actually, first I'd like to apologize uh, that my title was TBA until very recently. And that was because the organizers had sent, you know, when they invited me, they said, we'd like you to speak about quantum information and quantum gravity. And I thought they were specifying a title for my talk, whereas in fact it was just a general area. And so on Sunday, when I saw I was still uh, TBA on the title, I sent them this more specific title. But the, uh, the original title, um, or the one that I thought we were, I, I was assigned, quantum information and quantum gravity, is actually a pretty good one. Uh, in that what I'm going to do over the next uh, 50 minutes or so um, is try to basically introduce you to some of the, uh, the work that's happened in quantum information and quantum gravity over the past year. Um, of course, I'm going to emphasize this work that I've done with my co-authors, but most of the time is going to be spent on background uh, and context for these questions, and relatively little time on the detail, you know, the technicalities of what we, what we managed to accomplish. Um, and in doing so, this will also in some ways be an introduction to at least a couple of other talks, one by Fernando Pistowski later this morning, and one by Michael Walter on Thursday, also in this domain of the intersection of quantum information and quantum gravity. All right, so without further ado, uh, the beginning for the, uh, the story that I'm going to tell you today is the holographic principle, first proposed by Lenny Susskind and Gerard Tehuft back in the early 1990s. Uh, and the idea is very you know, appealing. All information uh, in a region of space is somehow encoded on, uh, as a hologram living on the sur in that volume's bounding surface. Now, as stated, it sounds like a completely crazy idea, right? That if we look at a, a volume of space, we could, for example, put a crystal in that volume, so the bunch of atoms arrayed in, some, uh, in, structure, in a structure like I've drawn here. Uh, and the number of bits that we could store in that crystal is going to be, say, proportional to the number of atoms. Each atom has a state. Uh, and so the number of bits is going to be proportional to the number of atoms, proportional to the volume, uh, not to the area. And so the idea that there's a, uh, the actual number of bits that you can store in a volume of space is not proportional to its volume, but only to its area, sounds just completely wrong. Right? Sounds like the units are wrong. You know, just dimensional analysis tells you this is not the way to go. But it's not quite as crazy as it sounds, uh, because the motivation for uh, proposing this idea back in the 90s is that if you try to put more and more atoms uh, into a given volume of space, originally the uh, eventually the density is so high that that volume of space or that that volume collapses to a black hole, uh, and the entropy of a black hole, which measures the number of bits you could possibly ever store in the thing, is proportional not to its volume but to its area, and so there's a fundamental limit on how much information can be stored in a given region of space, and if that limit is given by area and not by volume, so that was the motivation for this idea. Uh, but even when it was stated, it was still uh, seen as a crazy idea, right? Like there were some heuristic motivations for it, but there was no uh, very detailed justification. Um, but actually, just not so many years later, Juan Maldacena identified a concrete setting in which this holographic principle is realized, you know, mathematically and in detail. And this is known as the anti de Sitter space conformal fields theory correspondence. So it's a great big mouthful. People abbreviate it to ADS-CFT. Um, and I just want to give you, uh, you know, a short introduction to this idea, because it's going to be uh, animating the rest of the talk. Now, as a preamble to this introduction, I want to uh, emphasize to the people in the class, you, know, you may not be uh, experts in general relativity. You may not be experts in uh, quantum field theory. This is, more, this is the quantum information processing conference. You're experts in quantum algorithms and information and other things. Uh, but my, the point that I want to make is that you know everything you need to know to conceptually understand what we're going to be discussing today. So the setting may be unfamiliar, but the basic principles and ideas of quantum mechanics that are at play are ones that you're very familiar with. And so if you, you, know, if you find yourself uh, a little bit disoriented, you know, feel free to stop me and ask a question. So what is this correspondence? Uh, it is the statement uh, that two theories of physics are supposed to be isomorphic. Right? So they should have isomorphic Hilbert spaces. They should have Hamiltonians that map to each other. Isomorphically, observables map isomorphically, isomorphically from one to the other, and so on and so forth. They're the same thing. But uh, despite being the same thing, on the surface, they look extremely different. So what are these two, uh, these two theories? One of them is a theory of quantum gravity. Uh, quantum gravity in a particular kind of space-time. So that's this uh, anti-de-sitter space uh, 
quantum gravity theory. So it's going to be a quantum gravity theory in, let's say, d plus 1 dimensions. Okay? Uh, now, anti de Sitter space, uh, for our purposes here, we'll, we'll say a little bit more about, uh, uh, about its structure. But you should think of it as a space time in a box. Right? Th things are often made much simpler in physics by you know, getting rid of the infinities by putting things in a box. Anti de Sitter space is a space time in a box. And so if you're in anti de Sitter space and you have a, a laser pointer, and you shine it off in some direction. Now, if you aim it properly, that, uh, that beam of light is going to go out to some boundary and bounce back and come and, you know, and hit you again uh, in some finite time. Yeah? This is probably not relevant, but is there something as a de Sitter space? There is. Oh, okay. Yeah. We don't need to know. We don't need to know about de Sitter space. But it's much more relevant to your life, actually. We, li we live in something much like de Sitter space. But anyways. Uh, so, uh, so it's a space time in a box. Um, and uh, and it has this, this, so it has this boundary. Um, now, you're allowed in this theory uh, to put matter deep, you know, deep inside, we call it the bulk, in the interior. Right? So you can put black holes and solar systems and uh, you know, galaxies, whatever you like. You can put stuff deep inside, but it should, uh, it should calm down and become empty as you get out towards the boundary. And so in the boundary, it recovers the anti de Sitter geometry. Yeah. Yeah, so say there's reflecting boundary conditions. Yeah. Uh, so that's the, that's the one side. Now, this, now the space has a boundary, right? And so the other half of the correspondence is just a quantum theory that lives on the boundary, right? And it's a quantum theory that has no gravity in it, right? So it's something you can really just imagine. It's like a bunch of qubits. In this case, the boundary, you know, there's a t vertical time direction. So the, uh, there's one spatial dimension in this, as I've drawn it here. This in general works in higher dimensions. but there's one, let's just say there's one spatial dimension. So it's, think of it just a ring of qubits. And those qubits interact locally, right? Uh, and so with some particular kind of interaction. And that's your, your boundary theory. Um, and somehow these two things are supposed to actually be equivalent to each other. Now, the boundary theory has a little bit, has some, obviously some additional structure. We call it a conformal field theory. So it's not just any old physical theory, but it's one with a particular symmetry, basically a kind of scaling symmetry. Uh, and so um, you can arrive at such, you know, such theories, for example, by having a, uh, an interacting theory where you can tune the strength of the interactions so that you go through a phase transition. And right at the point of the phase transition, you have some scale invariance and typically conformal symmetry. Um, so that's the, that is the setup. These two uh, very different looking physical theories should be uh, identical. Yeah? Good question. Why does it say asymptotically ADS? Did I miss that? Um, well, I, I said two words about it, so you didn't, you didn't miss much. The point is you can put matter deep inside, which will alter the geometry locally. Okay. But then as you go out towards the boundary, it should, boundary, it should empty out. And so the, the geometry asymptotically becomes anti de Sitter, but doesn't have to be anti de Sitter deep inside. Yeah. Um, and there are specific, so I've only given you the, the rough outlines. And so you have to say specifically what you mean, ultimately, by theory of quantum gravity and what you mean by conformal field theory. The first example that was found was this enormous mouthful. I won't even bother to read it. Um, but it doesn't matter for our, our, our purposes. Uh, and now there are more examples of this correspondence that are uh, at least suspected to be true. And there's a great deal of evidence that varies a bit by uh, the specifics of which pair of theories you're talking about, uh, both analytical and numerical, that this really is an isomorphism. So in many cases, you can calculate two quantities uh, on the left and the right. The calculations look very different, but you get the same answer. So this builds your confidence that there is a correspondence, but there's no proof uh, at this point. It's a conjecture. Does this isomorphism Sorry? Does the isomorphism Okay, that's a very important, interesting question. Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, or rather, it has to preserve locality at some approximate level. Um, but, um, but ultimately, um, yeah, so, the, the, so uh, the bulk theory is ultimately going to be a non-local theory. The gravity makes things non-local. But if you ask only uh, relatively undetailed questions, then you wouldn't notice that it's a non-local theory. It's kind of the, but, it, but the precise details of how that locality emerges is one of the things that we're interested in discussing today. And it's a huge area of research. Um, so in this story, uh, there are, uh, there are well, there's sort of obvious mysteries and questions that you could ask, right? Uh, so 
in the quantum gravity theory, there's one extra spatial dimension. Where did it come from, right? Like somehow, uh, we started with this conformal field theory in D dimensions. It's supposed to be equivalent and describe quantum gravity in one extra spatial dimension. So there's a direction of space which, which is emergent, right? And so this gives us uh, you know, some context in which we can ask questions about how space can emerge from essentially nothing at all, from some, organi some other organization of degrees of freedom. You also want to know more, again, about the emergence of bulk locality and just about the nature of this isomorphism, how observables map back and forth. And so that's going to be the, the theme, the kind of questions that we're going to ask today. So again, just to help orient you, uh, if you take a spatial slice of this anti de Sitter space, then what you get is hyperbolic space, right? So uniformly negatively curved space. And Escher you know, was fond of drawing these beautiful renditions of hyperbolic space. Uh, this is the two-dimensional hyperbolic space. And so the, the way you measure distances in hyperbolic space, if you draw it this way, is you count fish. Right? So if you take two points on the disk and you want to figure out how far away are they, what is the metric, you count the minimal number of fish that you need to pass through to get from point A to point B. Right? So if I want to ask about the distance from here to there, the minimal number of fish I have to pass through is I take this, this, uh, this path, this geodesic, through the yellow fish. Now, what you can see from Escher's rendering is that the fish get smaller and smaller and smaller as you get out towards the boundary, and in fact, ultimately get infinitely small. So there's an infinite amount of distance between the point in the interior and the boundary. Right? Uh, and that's sort of, you know, important to keep in mind. As I said, we can place matter deep inside ADS space, like a black hole like so. Uh, and what it's going to do is it's going to uh, change the geometry. It's going to change the structure, for example, the geodesics. So if I wanted to calculate the shortest distance between two points, uh, that would now actually take a, a different path. So the plan for the rest of the talk uh, is that uh, we're going to start off, well, I've already given you a little bit of the ADS-CFT starter kit. We're going to talk about entropy in ADS-CFT, because this is a, an information conference, uh, and the structure of uh, entropy entanglement uh, in the conformal field theory is intimately related to the emergence of space. And so we're going to try to explore that question. In particular, we're going to explore it in the context of random Tetzer networks as giving us some sort of concrete toy model of what ADS-CFT might be doing. And it turns out that uh, this is going to be closely connected to something that, that was studied ages ago in quantum information theory, something called the entanglement of assistance. And it's even connected, believe it or not, to something that Ronald Hansen discussed in his talk yesterday, uh, the structure of or how you would make use of repeater networks to spread entanglement over long distances. So we'll get there. Um, and then we'll move on to questions uh, about this map between observables in the bulk and observables in the boundary. And we'll find that there's ambiguity there. And that was a conceptual puzzle that was really kind of tripping up people in the quantum gravity community who were you know, working in ADS-CFT. And it turns out it's not such a puzzle to people working in this room. The resolution to their confusion is that what's actually at work uh, an important part of the correspondence is quantum error correction. And once you have quantum error correction under your belt, everything makes sense. Uh, and then I'll give you some brief reports from the quantum information, quantum, quantum gravity frontier from the past year, if there's time, just highlighting some of the uh, other interesting things that have happened um, beyond uh, this story. So uh, entropy in ADS-CFT. Uh, let's talk about the conformal field theory. So again, just think of it as a ring of, a ring of qubits, if you like. Uh, and they're in some particular state. And what we would like to do is take a subset of the qubits, I've drawn it here as this region A, uh, and evaluate the entropy of A, right? The entropy of the reduced density operator. Now you all are experts in quantum mechanics, you know how to do this. You diagonalize the density operator, you uh, calculate the sum of minus P log P of those eigenvalues, and you get the entropy. But in practice, this is often a horrendous, painful, or even impossible calculation. Right? The, you know, this diagonalization of this enormous density operator is just a nightmare, uh, analytically, often. Um, but back in 2006, Ryu and Takianagi uh, identified a candidate formula for what the how the entropy should behave if this is a state um, in the, in the ADS-CFT correspondence where that CFT state should have an interpretation as a nice, smooth geometry. Right? Not all CFT states will, in general. Right? because there's an infinite number of them, and a lot of them will probably just correspond to completely unstructured mess of uh, quantum gravity. But some of the nice ones will correspond to classical geometries. And in that context, they said, well, the way you should calculate the entropy uh, is that it should be the area of some surface in the bulk. Um, and what surface is it? So in this simple example where 
my boundary region A is just an interval, uh, and the, uh, the boundary conformal field theory just has one spatial dimension, then what you should do is you should take surfaces in the bulk that start and end at the endpoints of that interval, uh, and you, you find the surface, in the, you know, the, really in this case, the curve in the bulk of minimum length. Right? In higher dimensions, it's a, a minimum area surface. Uh, so there are lots of different curves you could draw, uh, but the one that I drew here is the geodesic, right? connecting those two points, and that's the one of minimal length. And so this is an easy calculation. Right? This is just, you know, if you've taken you know, classical mechanics, you know, you've done some calculus of variations, this is an easy thing to do. Uh, and it may come as you know, a surprise to many of the people in the audience here that you know, doing calculations in general relativity can be easier than doing calculations in quantum mechanics. But this, is off, you know, this can be the case. And this is an example where this is often the case, that this is an easy way to calculate entropy, if it turns out to be right. The actual formula is 1 over 4 times Newton's constant, so it's just some constant, times the area of the minimal surface. Uh, and of course, well, on the left, of course, we have this fully quantum mechanical quantity. On the right, we have this geometrical general relativity quantity. So more generally, you know, beyond this example of an interval or in higher dimensions, what you should do is you should minimize over bulk surfaces homologous to A. So if you're not familiar with that language, you can see uh, in this case that if I take A and gamma A, uh, then together they are the boundary of this region in the middle. Right? So that's what it means for gamma A to be homologous, homologous to A, that together they're the boundary of something. Yeah? When you say proposal, do you mean it is a conjecture? OK, good. So. Uh, um, I'll answer you in 30 seconds. Um, so I just want to say uh, that this formula generalizes the Bekenstein-Hawking uh, formula for the entropy of a black hole. That if we had ADS uh, and we put a black hole deep inside, then we could ask, what is the entropy of the whole boundary? Right? Uh, and in that case, this minimization procedure uh, is going to hang up on a surface that sits on the horizon of the black hole. So you just get the area of the horizon. Uh, and so that's the generalization. Gilles asked about you know, what proposal actually means. Uh, when Ryu and Takinagi proposed this, they had examples where they could, ca could calculate on left and right, and they matched. Um, since then, the formula was observed to have, you know, obey certain consistency conditions, like it obeyed strong subadditivity. Uh, and ultimately, Lukowitz and Maltesena uh, gave what amounts to almost a proof, you know, assuming other uh, aspects of the ADS-CFT correspondence, which people tend to, tend to believe about how you map observables and so on. Um, it's not a proof in the full mathematical sense of the word. You know, there are technical <coughs> caveats, but there are, there's a sort of general story as to why this should be true. So this is, this is really quite an interesting uh, situation, right? So if we, if we didn't know about ADS, right? and we just, knew, we just had the conformal field theory, uh, then it would seem like a great mystery, right? Uh, the prescription for how you should calculate entropy is that you should, minim you should minimize areas in some geometry, right? But it's not the geometry on which the CFT is defined. It's some auxiliary space, right, which you just sort of proposed out of thin air. Uh, and then it, it begs the question, well, where did that auxiliary space come from? Where did the geometry of the bulk come from? Um, and back in, uh, well, 2012, I guess, Brian Swingle had a proposal. And again, it builds on ideas that came out of the quantum information community. So I think mo many people in the room are probably familiar with Mira, uh, that if you have uh, just, again, a state, uh, say, of a, a quantum system that's defined, say, on a ring, and that, that state is, uh, uh, well, um, has some conformal invariance, so it's representing the, the system at a phase transition, then Guifre Vidal, back in 2007, was trying to find out, find a, a con concise way to write down that state. Because of course, the, uh, as you all know, if you just tried to naively write it down, uh, if you had a qubit for each one of these legs around the outside, or rather you had a qubit at each point on the boundary, then the size of the Hilbert space grows exponentially with the number of qubits. It's hopeless to write it down. Uh, and Guifre proposed an ansatz, that rather than writing down a completely unstructured thing, what you should do is try to write the state as the contraction of some tensor network. So what he did is he, say, he said, OK, uh, instead of just having a totally unstructured list of numbers, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a network like this thing on the right. Uh, and for each vertex in the network, I'll have an array. Right? So if it's a vertex with three legs, it's a three-dimensional array of numbers. If it's a vertex with four legs, it's a, uh, a four-dimensional array of numbers. And then I'm going to do contraction like matrix multiplication along each of the edges. Uh, 
And this network has a kind of scale invariance built in. Uh, and it turns out that it is a good ansatz for writing down these states. Um, and what Brian Swingle noticed uh, is that, well, not just Brian Swingle, but actually uh, Giffre noticed this from the beginning, because it was part of his motivation, uh, that uh, there's an upper bound on the amount of entanglement that can be represented by such a state. And the upper bound, if I want to uh, represent, or if I want to calculate how much entanglement there can be between this region and its complement, the, the upper bound is given by the min cut between those two portions of the graph, right? So, because that's sort of an effective Hilbert space dimension. Uh, and so the min cut gives you an upper bound of the amount of entanglement, and it's, a, it's an achievable upper bound. Uh, and Brian Swingle noticed that that min cut, its shape is basically the same shape as the geodesics in hyperbolic space, right? And so the Mira tensor network uh, is another, uh, so the Mira tensor network uh, is another discrete representation of the geometry of hyperbolic space. And that motivated Brian Swingle to suggest that, in fact, uh, the way that geometry emerges is through the structure of the entanglement of the state itself, and even through, uh, in some poorly defined way, uh, the structure of a tensor network representing the state. And so uh, what I'd like to just sketch for you a little bit right now is how you can actually make that, uh, make that idea uh, quite precise by just thinking about networks of random tensors. Uh, and seeing uh, the behavior of the entanglement entropy. So here I have uh, a graph. I, uh, I have vertices and edges. Uh, and there are two types of vertices here. There are internal vertices uh, that have degree larger than one, and external vertices that have just degree one. Yeah? Um, so the, the Mira network uh, has the looks like a discrete representation of a spatial slice of anti de Sitter, of hyperbolic space. There's no time here, but it, it looks like, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Causal structure. Oh, so causal structure, we're not going to talk about for the moment. Uh, it's, it's a whole other story, but yes. Um, so here I just have a, a very small graph. Uh, I have some uh, degree one edges, which I'll think of as boundary. And I'll have internal vertices of higher, higher degree that I'll think of as bulk. Um, and the way that I'm going to construct my tensor is that for each uh, internal vertex, I'm going to have uh, a Hilbert space um, that's a tensor product of factors one for each edge touching that vertex. And so I have some quantum state, psi v, associated with the vertex. And for each edge of the graph, I'll just have a maximally entangled state. And so that I can write down a quantum state, which is just the inner product of these two things. Uh, so my, my vertex states contracted with my maximally entangled states. And I should actually put maximally entangled states also out on, uh, there's one for each edge, right? So there should be one out on the end as well. Hmm? Um, well, there's, there's some Hilbert space. I, I mean, so there should be a, a d by d dimensional Hilbert space here. Uh, basically, the ones on the, on, on the back just turn the, the bras of psi v into cats, right? They're just like, it's teleportation. You're, you're very familiar with this. Uh, OK. So, um, so this defines a state, right? So uh, the only places where I don't have bras contract with my cats are around the boundary. So this defines a state on the boundary. Uh, and this is really sort of some version of what's called a projected uh, a pep state, projected entangled pair state. Uh, and so if I choose my graph to be something like the mirror graph, then I should get some representation of hyperbolic space, or a state on whose entanglement structure should represent hyperbolic space. So all I have to do to specify a model or you know, a family of quantum states now is just tell you the distribution over these tensors psi v. Uh, and for the talk, uh, the rest of the talk, you just think, think of it as the unitarily invariant measure on all quantum states. Uh, version 2, uh, you could make that a random stabilizer state for stabilizers in some prime dimension that is large. Um, <coughs> You get essentially the same answers. In the stabilizer case, everything is even is you know, extra perfect. So every statement that I make, is an, which is approximate, in the stabilizer case becomes exact. So in this context, we can ask, for example, you know, if we're interested in entropy about the average purity, which is easier to calculate. Uh, so that's the expectation value over the choices of random tensor of the, re the square, the trace of the square, the reduced density operator of the state on some subset of boundary vertices. 
like these ones right here. Um, and again, uh, over the years at QIP, people have talked about ran averaging over unitarily invariant things many times, so I won't tell you how to do the calculation, uh, but it's an easy calculation. Uh, and